Well, it is good to be together on this uh, very special weekend for the whole of our nation. Um, and our theme on this series of the Inside Story is really especially poignant as we mark the 10th anniversary of September the 11th, 2001. For many people, that day brought immense pain and sorrow and irrevocable loss. And the truth is that many things were shaken that day far beyond the foundations of the Twin Towers. On a PBS special this week, a thoughtful woman described the comfortable view that she had adopted before September the 11th, 10 years ago. She had lived with the notion that there is no such thing as evil in the world. Reflecting on these days, she said, you know, some people do bad things, but to me, evil was an adjective, not a noun. Then she said, I can no longer live with that explanation. I don't know what I believe now, but on September the 11th, I lost my easy answers. Do you know, for some years now, uh, secular education has been teaching our children and our young people the postmodern myth that there is no such thing as good and, and evil, that somehow everything is just relative, that what people call good and what people call evil is merely culturally defined, and that what is right and what is wrong is entirely a matter for the individual. Then September the 11th came. And we saw the face of evil. And what happened was just too awful for a social or a cultural kind of explanation. And so people who have been reared all their lives in relativism and postmodernism began searching for language, for, for words, for categories to begin to speak about what had happened. And they suddenly found themselves, despite themselves, saying, this is Evil. Evil. And the foundations of relativism and the foundations of postmodernism itself shook. Because once you admit that there is such a thing as evil, and that it is in human beings, you have to ask the question, how did it get there? And what in the world can be done about it? Now, that is exactly what we are looking at together in this series that we have called The Inside Story, and in its first part, we're looking at the inside story of human life. If you would turn to the book of Genesis, we're going to look at several references in the Bible there today, because Genesis tells us the story not only of sin's origin, but also of its development. After Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden paradise of God, sin grew in the world. And if you open at Genesis in chapter 4, you will find, you can read it later, that the story that is recorded there is the sad story of how the first family fractured through fratricide. Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. You can read their story in that chapter. Cain became angry towards his brother Abel and eventually murdered his own brother. Very interesting, by the way, think about this. The man who declined to offer a blood sacrifice ended up shedding the blood of his own brother. There's a significant connection there. It was an early sign of devastation and destruction that sin would bring to the human family. Now, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters, and God's grace allowed the growth and the development of the human race. And Genesis in chapter 5, if you have that open in front of you, gives to us an account of the generations that came from Adam. Then in chapter 6 and verse 5, we have an extraordinary statement. By any standards, this is an extraordinary statement of how sin multiplied, of how it intensified as the early human family grew. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become. So this is about development, the growth, the progress of sin. And how every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Is that not an extraordinary statement? Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart, only evil all the time. It's a kind of triple whammy, isn't it? 
Sin was going everywhere within the human personality. It was always being pervasive, and it was being wholly pervasive all the time. It is an extraordinary statement about how in the time of Noah, evil had really taken over the whole world. That is what we are being told here. Now, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 is not telling us that the world is always as bad as this. Uh, This world is not heaven, but it's not hell either. But in the time of Noah, it was heading in that latter direction. At that time, in the time of Noah, the world became so dark that the Lord saw that every inclination of people's hearts was only evil all the time. Now, you read an extraordinary statement like that. You say, how in the world did the human race get there? How do we move from one sin that Adam and Eve committed within the garden to the devastation of a dark world in which sin and evil have become so pervasive that all the inclinations of men's thoughts and of their hearts were only evil all the time? And that's the story we're going to follow today. We're going to look at the inside story of the human race, and I want to begin by drawing your attention to two verses in the early chapters of Genesis. The first one is back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. If you turn back just two pages, you'll find that there. You remember last week, and we're building in this series, that God made Adam upright. That's Ecclesiastes in chapter 7 and verse 29. Now, here in Genesis, we're learning the same truth. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. By the way, isn't it interesting that the plural is used by God, an early foreshadowing of the later revelation of the three persons of the one living God, let God said, God singular said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So, verse 26, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. So, male and female together are created in the image of God The man, the woman, Adam and Eve, God made Adam upright. Adam and Eve are made in the image and in the likeness of God, period. God made Adam upright. Now turn over in your Bible just a couple of pages, please, back to chapter 5. Now I want you to see the contrast here. By this time in the Bible's story, Adam and Eve have listened to the tempter. They have sinned. They have set their hearts on being their own God. Remember, the tempter said, well, you can be as God. You can take the place of God. And Adam and Eve have been drawn to that. They have committed the first sin. They have been excluded from paradise. And now, outside of paradise, they have children. And look at what it says in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years... He had a son, notice the next phrase, in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Now, do you see the striking difference? It is very important. Adam is created in the image of God, but Adam's son, Seth, bears the image of his father, who is a sinner. God made Adam upright. But men have gone in search of many schemes. That is what we learned last time. Adam became a sinner, and the son of Adam is born in the father's likeness. Now, of course, that will raise the question in your mind, and theologians have debated this over the centuries. Um, Is Seth, then, also made in the image of God? And my answer to that is yes. And my reason for giving a positive answer to that question is one more page over in the Bible story in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Because you notice the statement there, which is made now well and truly after sin has got going within the world, and now God is speaking about fallen humanity, and uh, he gives this law, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God 
has God made man. So that is a reference now not simply to Adam, but it is a reference to Adam's fallen children. That is the explanation for the title of the message this uh, week. The sons and daughters of Adam live with the enigma of a double image, made in the image of God, but born in the likeness of Adam. You need to know this double truth about yourself. This is where self-knowledge begins. You need to know this is who you are, as I uh, need to know that this is who I am. Made in the image of God, born in the likeness of Adam. You are made in the image of God, and that gives your life today meaning, significance, value, dignity, and worth. That's why it's worth living, because you are made in the image of God. But you are also born in the likeness of Adam, which means that you are a sinner by nature. We are all born that way. Now, C.S. Lewis has a wonderful phrase uh, in which he captures, um, in a picture as it were, um, the enigma of this double image with which we are all born into the world. He says, to come from Lord Adam and to come from Lady Eve is both honor enough to erect the head of the poorest beggar and shame enough to bow the shoulders of the greatest emperor on earth. That's C.S. Lewis. If you know the truth about yourself, you will have reason to lift up your head in thankfulness to God. Your life has dignity and worth. You are made in His image. If you know yourself, you'll also have find reason to get on your knees before God because you are born in the likeness of of your father, Adam, uh, who is a sinner. Now, this doctrine of the double image is of huge importance. It is foundational to the Christian faith, and it is of massive importance in terms of understanding our world today and of presenting the gospel to secularists who do not believe that there is such a thing as evil. So, I, I, I ask you to consider this question. Why is it wrong to fly a plane into the Twin Towers and take the lives of thousands of people? You say, well, you don't know the answer to that. You shouldn't be standing on a Christian platform. But I'm asking you the question, why is that wrong? See, think about it. If we are only developed animals who evolve by the survival of the fittest, how is that different from snuffing out a hornet's nest? And the answer is because men and women are not hornets. We are made in the image of God, and that is what gives every human life supreme dignity, value, and worth. Second question. Why then in this wonderful world created by God do men who are made in the image of God perpetrate such extraordinary deeds of evil? And the answer is because we are born in the likeness of Adam, and we are sinners by nature and by practice. We live in a dark and a dangerous world, and nothing in this world, no work, no family, no church, nothing in this world, no nation, is as it should be. And never will be the side of heaven. So, here is the first thing that we need to learn today, and this is really important. It is foundational for Christian faith. Sin is in us by nature. And I take that from Genesis in chapter 5 and verse 3. Think of it. God, Adam came out of the hand of God, as it were, upright. But Seth came out of the womb, as you and I did. He was born in the likeness of his father and of his mother, a sinner. Poor Seth. Don't you feel sorry for him? And we're in exactly the same position as he was. Sin was in his father and his mother by their own choice. But for Seth, sin was in him by birth even before he started. He got it from his dad and from his mom. He was made and born in the likeness of his father, a sinner. And not only was sin in him, but when he was born, he was born into a fallen world. Sin was all around him. 
Whereas God had placed his father in the creation in this garden paradise, Seth was born outside paradise, as we are born outside of paradise, in a world under the curse of sin, a world that would experience pain and would experience suffering. Because even the very creation itself, since the entrance of sin into the world, is groaning in frustration, Paul says, uh, longing for the full redemption that will only come at the time of the return of Jesus Christ. And can you imagine little Seth growing up, trying to come to terms with the world in which he lives, the world in which he's been born, trying to come to terms with what is in him? And one day his dad makes a little fire and they sit outside the tent and Adam puts his arm round his son's shoulders as dads sometimes do and he says, uh, hey Seth, you know, it's time we had a little talk. And Adam says to him, Seth, you ought to know, son, that you have two brothers. Really? Where are they? Well, one of them is dead. Oh, how did he die? Your other brother killed him. Your mother and I haven't seen him since that day. He's become a restless wanderer on the earth, your brother. Friends, sin is in us and sin is all around us. And sin is in even the best of us. See, this was true even of King David. I'm trying to think of the best hero I can imagine in the Old Testament, and I'm going for King David because he was described as the man after God's own heart. And listen to what the man after God's own heart says about himself. He says this, surely I was sinful at birth. At birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, understand David is not saying here that uh, his mother conceived him through a sinful act. What David is saying is that his life, the life that was conceived by the union of his father and his mother, his life is the life of a sinner. That is how every person born into the world since the fall of Adam and Eve is. And so, I, I put it to you this way, sin runs in the blood. Grace does not. Sin runs from one generation to another in the human family. Um, We are all born alienated from God. We're going to see that more fully in Ephesians chapter 2 in the coming weeks. We are all born alienated from God. Now, this could be a unique moment right now for some of us. And I have prayed much over this moment in the message. I have often had a conversation that has gone something like this. I've said to a person, tell me, how did you become a Christian? And when I've asked that question, I have too often heard this answer. I was born that way. Now, I want to say to you, if you've ever said that or thought that, and I'm sure that there are folks among us here, you come from a Christian family and so forth and so on, a good family background, and you say, well, I I was just born this way. Hear me, that is not possible. Friend, you can be born a Jew. You can be born a Muslim. You can be born a Hindu. You cannot be born a Christian. It is impossible. Christianity does not run in the blood. Sin does. The only thing that we can be born, as it were, is as a sinner. That's what we're learning from Genesis in chapter 3, 5, and verse 3, which is why Jesus said, think about what Jesus is saying, flesh gives birth to what? Flesh. Only the Spirit, and he's referring to God the Holy Spirit, can give birth to Spirit. So Jesus says, you should not be surprised at me saying to you, you must be born again. Because nobody is a Christian by birth. It is impossible. 
You may say, well, wait a minute, you don't understand. Pastor, I come from a good family. I was born to Christian parents. Friends, that's my story. I come from a good family. I was born to Christian parents. But that did not make me a Christian. Nor can it make anyone a Christian. I was born a sinner, and so were you, however good your family. Sin runs in the blood. Grace does not. Some of us may have just got this the wrong way around. We've got the idea that Christianity runs in the blood, that grace runs in the blood, and, and we've thought that sin does not. If you've been working on that assumption, I plead with you to listen to the Bible today. Your eternal condition may hang on it. You can't ride into heaven on the coattails or the faith of your parents or of your friends or of simply being connected in some way to the church. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You must be born, says Jesus, again. Sin runs in the blood, grace does not. Actually, if you think about it for one moment, that is good news. If grace ran in the blood, what hope would there ever be for all who were born into faithless families? But the truth is grace does not run in the blood. Sin runs in the blood. But what that means is that sin is the great leveler. We are all on, as it were, a level playing field, all in exactly the same position before God. We all stand before God, however privileged our background, however wretched our background, we all stand before God in exactly the same position. Sinners. To whom God offers his grace in Jesus Christ. And I've got to tell you, as I prayed about this part of the message and asked of God that He would shine a light so that some of us may be able to receive it for the first time, that is a big prayer. No doctrine is more repugnant to the natural mind and heart of a man or a woman than this. There is no truth that a sinner is more resistant to hearing and receiving than the truth that we are all sinners. If you believe this to today, it is because God has given light to you. If, if your mind is opening to this right now, thank God He's working in your mind and in your heart right now. And friends, you need to know that many churches are erasing this truth fast. Have you noticed as you visit around various places how Often, I've been struck by this when I've had opportunity to travel, how often confession of sin is quietly dropped from worship services. How massive tracts of Scripture that repeat this foundational Christian truth are silently glossed over. Did you know that there are active projects that are going on in our country to rewrite all the great hymns of the faith and to eliminate all references to sin because it's not a positive notion to make people feel good on a Sunday morning? I plead with you to take this truth seriously. Sin is in us all by nature. If you don't see that something is wrong with you, how will you ever come to Christ? Only when we see our true condition will we see that our hope is in Christ and in Christ alone. So, this is a massive truth for us to try to digest today. Uh, it, it, it has the power to, to shift the whole trajectory of our living if we really embrace it and get hold of it. Sin is in all of us by nature. Here this is the second thing. Sin is a vicious enemy. It is a vicious enemy. If you glance back at Genesis chapter 4, and there in verse 6, the Lord says to Cain, well, now, why are you angry and why is your face downcast? He says, if you do what is right, you'll be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, notice these next words, sin is crouching at your door. What a picture. 
the image here is as if sin was a predator, like a wild animal, a lion, um, and it's crouching at the door, and God says it desires to have you, to destroy you, to take you, but you must master it. So I want you to see not only is sin present within every one of us by birth, by nature, but sin is a, an active and a destructive power. It is a vicious enemy. It desires to have you. You cannot live your life passively because there, there's an enemy at the gates, as it were. Sin is crouching at your door. So over this weekend, the Homeland Security Forces will be on the highest alert because we have powerful enemies who want to destroy us, and they will never stop hatching new schemes to try and do it. They want to have us. So the work of watching and the work of interrupting these schemes is never done. That's exactly how it is with sin. Do you realize, God is saying to Cain, that sin is crouching at your door? Cain didn't listen, and his life was destroyed by sin. Took him over. It had him. I wonder what percentage of us took in water during the heavy rains a few weeks ago. I think quite a lot of us. I, I, we didn't have too much damage, but we got it into three rooms, and uh, uh, so we're having some fun with the clear up and so forth, and uh, especially with drywall. Um, suppose you paint a wall, and a child comes with a crayon and marks over your beautifully painted wall. You know, you might get a little bit frustrated, but you can wash the wall, you can get rid of the crayon. Um, if it's really bad, you can paint the wall over. Not that big a deal. But suppose you have mold in your house. Painting over the mold won't help. So our house took on some water, and here's me cutting out two feet of drywall right around the bottom, all that stuff, taking out the insulation behind. Crayon leaves a mark that is easily dealt with, but mold is a living thing. You can't leave it. It spreads. It will take your health. It would destroy your house. Sin is not like crayon. Sin is like mold. The crayon is static. The mold is on the move. Sin is crouching at your door. It's a living thing, and it desires to have you. It needs to be cut out, or it's going to destroy your house. So please understand this. Sin is much more than a list of things that you may have done wrong. If that's your notion of sin, you've not really understood it from the Bible. Sin is much more than a list of things that you may have done wrong. Sin is a living power. It is a vicious enemy, and is, it, it is at work within you as it is at work within me. That's why we have the battle of the Christian life, and we're going to look at that in a few weeks' time. So I ask you this question, really. Um, we, we thought about the presence of sin. Are you taking the presence of sin in your own life seriously? I ask this question now, are you taking the power of sin in your own life seriously? This power is bigger and greater than you are. Most of you will perhaps have heard the name of John Stott, one of the finest Christian leaders in uh, this last generation, who now is with the Lord, having died just a few weeks ago at the age of 90. Many years ago, before I had the privilege of being here, John Stott spoke at this church. A gracious, godly man, a man marked by integrity, one of the most highly respected Christian leaders 
around the world, it was a great privilege for our church to have John Stott on one occasion in our pulpit. As I say, I was not here, but I've heard from a number of longer-time members of the congregation about the day that he came and the message that he gave. And what's absolutely fascinating is I've heard one thing that he said, one sentence that he said from several different people. So, you know, if you get it from multiple sources, it's true. You also know out of everything he said, there was one sentence that hit people between the eyes. The most respected Christian leader of a generation stood in our pulpit and he said this, there is no sin that my flesh is not capable of committing within 30 minutes of leaving this church. There is no sin that my flesh is not capable of committing within 30 minutes of leaving this church. And you want to let that sink in as I thought, John Stott said that? <laughs> and if you find that really difficult to embrace, I challenge you as to whether you have really taken seriously the reality of the power of sin that God says to Cain is crouching at your door. But for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not know what you would in particular circumstances that might arise. Sin resides in our flesh, and it crouches at the door. Now, here's what we've got then. Sin is in all of us by nature. It is a vicious enemy. We've looked at its presence. We've looked at its power more briefly. This last point, sin leaves us needing an intervention from God. When you really see that this vicious power is present within you, when you really see what it means to be born in the likeness of Adam as well as made in the image of God, you will begin to see that every person needs the intervention of God. That is our need in every human life. And I want you to pick up on Genesis 4 and verse 26, where we're told, at that time, very significant phrase, chapter 4 and verse 26, the end of the chapter, at that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. By the way, that's the first mention of prayer, the first reference to prayer in the entire Bible. This is the first time we read that men began to call on the name of the Lord. That's what prayer is. And it happened at that time. At what time? What was it that caused men to pray for the very first time? And the answer is when the destructive powers of sin became obvious in the world, broken families, violence, murder, men saw evil in its ugly colors Adam must have begun to say, I never realized it would do this, and this is in me too. And they began to ask God for help. And it doesn't say that all men did this, all men will not ask God for help, but some men did. Some men saw and some women saw what sin was doing in the world, and when they saw what sin was doing in the world, they knew that they needed to pray, God, we need your help. This is bigger than us. What's going on around me in my life? I'm facing incredible darkness. It's bigger than me. And I need an intervention from you. I need your help. And men begin to call on the name of the Lord for the very first time. What does God do? Two things that are both very wonderful, and I'll mention them just briefly. Men begin to call on the name of the Lord, and as you follow the story through Genesis, you find that God does two things. The first is that God wonderfully restrains sin, and we should thank Him for this. That is what happened, of course, through the flood, which is the story that follows in the subsequent chapters. God restrains sin in the world. 
If you think this world is bad, dark, and evil, you cannot imagine what it would be if God took His hand off. If God took His restraining hand off sin, it would be hell itself. That's what hell is when God's restraint is taken off and the full ugliness of what evil is is left. How does God restrain sin? I don't have time to go into this. Let me just give you the headings and you can ponder them a little more fully. God restrains sin through the law. Thank God for law. Thank God for law in our country. Thank God for law in the Bible. Law is a gift from God. If you see a policeman this weekend, thank him. Tell him that he is a gift of God or tell her that she is a gift of God in a fallen world. Without the law, our streets would not be safe. And it is a gift of God that restrains sin in our world. Second, conscience. We saw last time that Adam was a law to himself. He didn't need a written law. Why? Because the law was already impressed on his own heart. Well, now, of course, much of that has been erased since the fall. But in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15, the apostle makes it quite clear that there is some residue of this, and we call it conscience. Conscience. Bearing witness. And Paul says this is true even of people who are not believers, even of godless people. There is some functioning of conscience for which we should thank God. Number three, common grace. That is, as distinguished from saving grace, we're not talking about how God saves people. We're talking about the kindness that God shows to people indiscriminately, just as He causes the sun and the rain to come for all people. So there are gifts of God and kindnesses of God that come to all people, His enemies as well as His friends. So when you see someone who has absolutely no time for Christian faith, but she is a good mother, Or you see someone who is a rampant atheist and will not have any time at all for your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he is a good neighbor and looks after an elderly person who lives next door. You say, where does that goodness come from? It is an echo of the image of God, even in an unbelieving person for which we should thank God. Common grace restrains sin so that nobody is as bad as we might be apart from the grace of God. And God cuts sin back through judgment in this world. Think of it this way. Sin is like a massive weed, a massive weed that would take over and destroy the whole world, except that God keeps cutting it back. He doesn't cut it out, but He cuts it back. That is what happened in the flood, and it has happened in other less dramatic ways throughout history. When a nation becomes Um, intolerably evil, God either sends revival or He causes that nation to fall. You can read that in history. That's why the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to people because there comes a point where if sin takes hold within a society, the society itself is judged by God and it collapses. And that's a merciful thing so that the world may be protected. The the weed is being cut back. So God restrains sin. But of course, you know, He only does that in part. The law restrains some, but not all. Conscience restrains to some extent, but not fully. Um, Common grace shines on some much more than others. Judgment in this life comes on some wickedness, but clearly not all. God is not removing the weed during the course of human history. He's just cutting it back. But its root And its sprouting leaves continue throughout the generations of human history. Its growth and its root remain until the day when Jesus Christ comes in power and glory. Which is why our hope is not in God's restraint of sin, cutting back evil in the world. Our hope lies in God redeeming sinners in the day when God will take the weed up by the root and cast the whole thing into the fire, and sin shall be no more. Then there will be, the Bible says, a new heaven, and there will be a new earth, and that will be the home of righteousness. 
And it will be very wonderful because remember that suffering came into this world on the coattails of sin. So when sin is finally evicted from this world, the weed is pulled up and it is cast into hell, suffering will go out of the world on its coattails as well. There will be, the Bible says, no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain. And God will wipe away all tears from the eyes of his people. That is the hope of the world, and it is in Jesus Christ. You say, how can sinners be in the home of righteousness? There's only one way. You remember what John the Baptist said? When Jesus began his ministry, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our hope is in him. Our hope is in him. That is true for every person, every culture, every nation, every generation. Only in him. One story and we're through. I'll never forget the Sunday after September the 11th and the particular sense of responsibility bringing the Word of God on that day. And of the many conversations that I had after the service, one will always remain in my mind. A woman who I had never seen before really came rushing up to me after the service. I'd never seen her in church before. Uh, To my knowledge, she has not been there again. I certainly have not seen her there again, but she was there on that day, as with many people who suddenly felt a sort of momentary need of God. And so she came to church first Sunday after September the 11th. She comes rushing up to, to me, quite distressed, and she says, Pastor, Pastor, how can I tell my children that they're safe? And I said to her, You can't. The world isn't safe. She looked absolutely astonished. I said to her, listen, we need to learn to live in this world in such a way as to be prepared for the next. That's what I need to do. That's what you need to do. And that's what we need to tell our children. Will you pray with me? Father, we confess the presence and power of sin, not only in the world, but in ourselves. We see it. We see it around We see it within, and we receive your word into our hearts by way of confession today. But as we absorb this uncomfortable truth, we want to lift up our minds and thank you for the Redeemer, to bless you today for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord Jesus Christ, I look to you for mercy and for deliverance today. I look to you and call out to you and feel my need of you and put my trust in you, the one who died and who rose to destroy the power of the evil one. Gladly I embrace you today by faith and take my stand as one of your people. Save me from my sins today through Jesus Christ my Lord, and all who believe this together said,